Good morning. Welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ of Lowell. I am Jackie Towsley, substituting for Shannon Hanley as she's traveling with our youth to Memphis for a service and learning experience. We will be led in worship by Reverend Elizabeth Vanderhagen, who serves the Boston Square Church in Grand Rapids, as Pastor Shannon is also leading the youth trip. Reverend Vanderhagen will be preaching our third sermon in the series Women of the Way. Welcome, Reverend Vanderhagen. If you are in need of support from the church this week, um, you may connect with our moderators, Teresa Beecham or Roland Hoxbergen. Kim Lum is also available to take your call. We hope everything just remains calm and cool this week, but we do have um, a, an arrangements to take on any emergency calls or needs you may have. Other announcements. Your returnable beverage cans or bottles can be put in our collection bins outside the south door. All the proceeds from those returnables benefit our youth programming. The social justice mission team is asking you to consider participating in Plastic Free July. This is a global challenge to reduce single-use plastic containers and such. Check out the new book selection in the social, social justice library. There's lots of things highlighting environmental challenges. If you bought shares from the youth to benefit their trip to Memphis this week, be sure to mark your calendar for the July 19th shareholders dinner. It's going to be some yummy food of smoked pork and sides and then you'll have an opportunity to learn about what they experienced as they are in Memphis. Please stay after worship for some coffee, cookies, and conversation in the Family Center. And those are the announcements I know of. Anyone else? All right. So let's begin our worship with a time of greeting your neighbors and passing the peace of Christ. Okay, please remain standed if, standing if you are able and join me for the responsive call to worship. Great is God and worthy of praise. We gather, we observe, we ponder the beauty of God's world. The power of God is at work among us today. Amen. And we'll remain standing and sing hymn number 68, God is Truly With Us.
Oh, well, the little light is on now, so that helps too. Okay, good morning, folks. We're a smaller group today because uh, we know where uh, people are. But it's our time to uh, uh, talk with each other a little bit, to tell us what's uh, going on, each other what's going on, and um, to pray for the community and the broader world as we are drawn. What is going on in your lives this week that brings you special joy or that gives you something that you want to tell us about that we should pray about here as a body? It's time for us to share. I'll go this way. Teresa, you first, and then you send it to Jessica. Good morning, all. I just want to boast a bit. We have our local Lowell Ledger, which has been in existence for about 130 years. And our pastor now is writing a column in the Lowell Ledger. This, this issue happens to be the first uh, column that she wrote. And I picked up a couple extra copies and have them on the high top table just in the family center. And this coming week, um, Wednesday, the paper will be out. It can be bought at Meyer and at um, some of the gas stations if you do not subscribe. But I would suggest a subscription. I bought a $35 uh, commitment uh, for the subscription each year. Thank you. Support your local news. Yay. <laughs> So as most of you know, my father, Jerry, has had some medical issues. Um, he had called me yesterday, which is very out of the ordinary for him. Um, he's not a phone person. Um, he did let me know that he cannot no longer get off the couch. Um, he's yet to use the bathroom for three days now to get up. Um, so definitely declining in health. Um, so just please pray for comfort. My stepmom did message me this morning. Um, did say that he does need to go to the doctor. He's been saying it, um, that he needs to go. She's just waiting for him to say so. Um, every time he tells her he needs to go, she's like, well, you want me to call the ambulance? Because, of course, he can't get out by himself. And he's like, not yet. So hopefully, just please pray that hopefully he does decide to go to the hospital before it's too late and get some medical care that he needs. Thank you. My sister is finally eating some solid foods after six weeks. Um, she's struggling with that still, but at least the trend is our friend. She can kind of eat. And my cousin's husband, whom I spoke about last week with leukemia, um, finally has approval from the insurance company to get the drug that will treat him. So I'm going to ask for prayers for people who are underinsured, not insured, bound by their restrictions of their insurance company, bound by their work to receive the health care that everyone deserves. Oh, I'm supposed to say something now, like, uh, Lord, in your mercy. Yes. <laughs> I just, my brother-in-law, they found a different type of cancer in his mouth, but they seem to be on it. Um, it's just sad. But the good news is that his husband got a job. Yay! <laughs> That's your brother? My brother-in-law. Brother -in yeah. Lord, in your mercy. Just want to mention once again our youth traveling and their leaders that they will have a wonderful experience, um, gain some insight into people unlike themselves perhaps, have safe journeys, and return to us next Saturday. How many people are there on that trip, Jackie? I think there were 15 and five or six very good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for that too. Huh? Uh, my cousin Jim, um, I spoke about him last year when he had to have his leg amputated below the knee. And he's no longer able to take care of himself independently, so he's being moved into an assisted living facility. Um, I just want your prayers to help him make that adjustment because it's bothering him a little bit. Lord, in your 
mercy. Anything else? Anybody particularly joyful this week about any particular thing? Just joyful. <laughs> That's a good thing. Maybe you don't know this. I live at a lake. I have a little bitty home at a lake with lots of mansions around me. But on the 4th of July, my extended family comes. And we had a wonderful day in the sun and water. So I'm very thankful. Those are good times. Lord, we give you thanks for that. What am I supposed to say when it's a good thing? <laughs> yeah. Thanking the good Lord. Anything else that we're thankful for, especially this week? I was thinking this morning, I would say, what are we joyful about this week? Because this has been a kind of a hard, for me, who pays attention to politics, it's been a very hard week for me. And it's, I don't know where things are going, and it's scary. I'm scared for a lot of things. And so that's a concern, I guess. It's, it was hard to be joyful. I look at the sun this morning. It's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful day. We hear about heat around the country, and we've had a pretty good summer this far, hasn't we? Haven't we? We've kind of escaped all that. It's been pretty nice weather. So there's always a mix of things to give thanks for, to be joyful about, and things to pray about because they're concerning to us. Anything else? Yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share my sister, my younger sister, sometimes she comes here, had her second son last Friday. To, he's about a week in a couple days old. Um, his name is Ren Wallace, and he's super cute. So really thankful that they're healthy and excited to have a second nephew. Well, there's something to give thank, uh, thanks about. So uh, uh, Lord, in that, in your, what do we say? I forget. There, there's a phrase. Thanks be to God. Yeah, but then I thought, we, I thought I was supposed to lead in so that we all say something together. Oh, okay. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Holly. That's wonderful. It's lovely to see little children, isn't it? In there. Doesn't always work out the way we want, but sometimes when it does, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. All right, let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. And uh, so if you'll join me and we'll conclude with the, uh, uh, with the Lord's Prayer. That's in your bulletin if you would like to read it there. Creator God, loving God, healing God, you have heard our concerns this morning. You have heard about the people who are suffering in a variety of ways and who the little bit about those around them who are taking care of them. So we give you thanks for the people who are caring and loving, and we pray for healing for the people who need healing, our cousins, our fathers, our sisters, uh, other relatives, our friends. Um, you know what we all need. All of us are hurting and broken in some ways, and so we pray that you will give us your healing presence and, uh, and make us the people you want us to be. We thank you for the good things that are happen happening, for the joy that we have uh, just in our daily lives, for the birth of a new baby, uh, for the healing that we have experienced, for the youth group and the leaders who are in Memphis. And we pray that you will bless them, that they might have a wonderful experience and be able to share your love with people there. Be with our pastors, especially with, uh, with Shannon, and Shannon and the other leaders there. And uh, we pray for this community, this church, that you will help us continue to be a progressive presence in this community in the midst of uh, what are trying times. We pray for this community, the Lowell community, that you will help it resolve or deal with the issues that it faces. We thank you for the news that is shared about it, and we pray that that news will uh, spread among the people and give us all a sense of, I hesitate to say pride, but some pride in our community so that we are able to serve other people with a progressive voice through it. 
Give us joy. We thank you for the joy that we have, and we pray that you will give us joy and healing and love in the week ahead. Hear us now as we pray together. Our God, who is in heaven, blessed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We now have the opportunity to share with others, with this church, with the community, of the bounty that we've been gifted uh, by God. And so uh, if you have some things that you would like to uh, contribute to the offering this morning, now is the time. I need some people, some younger folks, to collect that. I think we have one. <laughs> Good. Do we have, and there we have two young people. Good. Thank you so much. Three, all right. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, do I pray now? Oh, absolutely. Okay. There you go. There's one for you. No, we're good, right? Join me now in our prayer of thanksgiving. Holy God, Okay, would the children come forward, please? It was looking bleak out there for a while. I didn't know if I was going to have any kids or not. All right, got a question for you. And since you're both in my class, you might know this one. What is the most important commandment? Do you know? To love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Is it only the person who lives next, lives next door to you? No. Are they your neighbor? Yeah. How about out here? Are they your neighbors? Yeah. Over here? Yeah. Everybody is our neighbor. So should we love everybody? We probably should. In our Sunday school class, we have shoebox lessons. And each lesson comes in a shoebox. And when we open it, we have stuff in here. What have I got? 
Is it a big heart? Pretty big. Do you think this heart, this size, is the best heart you can have? Hmm. So what if I have this heart? Does this heart better than this heart? Which one is best? You think the big heart is the best? What if I have this heart? You think this one is the best? Does it matter what color the heart is? No, but really size isn't going to matter either. It's going to matter what comes out of your heart and the kindness that you give everyone that's going to make a big difference. So um, which one do you think is worth the most? Think the big heart still? <laughs> Let's see. What I want you to do is go around, give everybody a heart. Yeah, I think you got everybody. Oh. Good job, Thea. You can go give Miss Nancy one. Now, everybody has a different heart. Does that mean? Oh, thank you. Did you get one? You take that one. I'll take this guy here. If everybody has a different color heart, does that mean they love differently? No. Who do we love? Everyone. Do you love your mom and dad the same as you love your toys? Oh, good answer. <laughs> it's a little bit of a trick question. Do you love your siblings more than you love your mom and dad? Or do you love them differently? The same, good. Sometimes I grew up in a family with six kids. I was one of six kids. Sometimes we just loved each other differently. I'm just going to say, it wasn't always the same. Yeah, you all know. All right, how do we show love? How do you show love? Hmm? Caring for people. OK, caring for people. How do you care for people? Help them. Okay, help them. What do you think, Noah? How else do you show love? Well, um, show love because um, we were watching a movie that made me emotional, and that's how I care about people. Okay. Okay. Big heart. Yes, you do have a big heart. Um, okay, there's other ways we can. In this church, on Thursdays, we serve a meal. Do we say, you can't come in because you're too tall? Do we say, you can't come in because you're not dressed like me? No, we let everybody come in and have a meal, anybody that wants to. So that's one way this church shows love. So we all have different ways of showing love. Sometimes when you see someone and they're kind of quiet or their head is down, and you look at them and you think, mm, maybe they've had a rough day. Maybe a test didn't go so well. Maybe their job didn't go so well. Maybe someone said something that was a little bit mean. And if we give love back to them and show them that we really care, maybe just by giving them fist bump, okay? Maybe by giving them a pat on the back, okay? Things like that we can do when we get, yes? Oh. <laughs> Behind the times. All right. Um, so do you know when you do something kind or you show love for someone, 
they tend to then want to show love to someone else. It's called paying it forward. So what I want you to do is put your hands out like you're going to hug somebody. Pucker up like you're going to kiss somebody. We're going to give everybody hugs and kisses out here. Take and pass those around on one side, and we'll have Noah do the other side. We have hygienic hugs and kisses. The striped ones are the white chocolate. The solid are the dark cho or the regular chocolate. Just in case you don't like the white chocolate, <laughs> I'll give you a hint. All right, um, let's bow our heads in a prayer and then we'll go to class, okay? All right, dear Lord, thank you for blessing us with the chance that we can share our love with others. Help us to remember that throughout the week. Amen. And I'm not sure how to turn this off.
I am really honored and a little nervous to be with you all this morning. Um, Shannon has been for a long time a dear friend and has preached often for our congregation, and I am really glad to get to preach for you. I've heard wonderful things about you all. Our scripture reading this morning is Judges chapter 4, and it is a long and detailed chapter that may be helpful to have in front of you this morning. So I encourage you. What should I do? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. All right. Judges chapter four. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Heresheth Hogoyim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Ebenoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kedesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went with him. Now Heber, the Kenite, had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zananim near Kedesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Ebenoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Heresheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, go. This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Heresheth Hagoyim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, 
Come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone there, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I'll show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites, and the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. Here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. If you're interested in reading more about Deborah and Jael, there are a couple of books that I've drawn from heavily this morning that I'd recommend. Preaching the Women of the Old Testament by Lynn Japinga, and Fierce, Women of the Bible and Their Stories of Violence, Mercy, Bravery, Wisdom, Sex, and Salvation by Alice Connor. They're both very accessible and informative and not just for preachers. There's a pattern in the book of Judges. God's people, instead of following God's ways, do what is right in their own eyes and is often evil in the Lord's eyes. They worship idols and mistreat their neighbors and then God hands them over, and they get conquered and oppressed by another nation. And this doesn't happen because God is mean, but because sin has consequences, and because we were created to worship God and be in right relationship with each other. And when we don't and aren't, things don't go well with us. The pattern in Judges is that the people sin and are conquered, and then they cry out to God, and God raises up a deliverer for them and rescues them, and they follow God's ways for as long as that deliverer lives. And then when the deliverer or judge dies, they go back to doing evil, and the cycle repeats itself. We heard a bit of that in the reading this morning. Ehud dies and the Israelites do what is evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they're conquered by Jabin, king of the Canaanites. One of the things you might have noticed in the reading this morning is that there are a lot of names, people's names and place names. The geography in this story is of interest, and the meanings of the people's names are interesting too. First, we hear of Jabin, which means he will understand. Jabin, a commentator observed in this story, will come to understand that God is king, and God will not tolerate oppression. Jabin is a title, kind of like Pharaoh, for a king of Canaan, and he rules from Hazor, a northern fortified city. The ruins are still there today. Jabin has an army commander named Sisera, based in Harasheth Hagoyim, 
which is a town on the flatlands. And that's strategic because Sisera and his army have 900 chariots fitted with iron. And chariots are best driven across flat land. This was top military technology, the most advanced weapons, weapons that Israel did not have. Israel had reason to be afraid. The enemy was a lot faster than they were. Remember too that Pharaoh and the Egyptians had chariots when they pursued Israel to the Red Sea. And like Pharaoh, the narrator tells us that Sisera cruelly oppressed the Israelites. And just as they did when they were slaves in Egypt, the Israelites called out to the Lord for help, and God heard their cries. And then there's a bit of a departure from the pattern in Judges, because this time, instead of the narrator announcing that God raised up a deliverer, a judge, this time the narrator tells us that there's already a judge in Israel, Deborah. The first thing that we learn about Deborah is that she is a prophet, someone who listens to God and tells the people what she hears God saying. Someone who calls the people to live in God's ways. And again, the names are interesting. Deborah means bee, like the insect, but it's really close to the Hebrew words for speak and word. And one of the ways that Deborah the bee delivers Israel is with her words, by speaking to Barak. But that's getting ahead of the story. She's also identified as the wife of Lapidoth, and Lapidoth means torch or fire. And Deborah will go on to light a fire under Barak, because that's what prophets have to do sometimes. Deborah, the fiery woman, the prophet, held court under the palm of Deborah in the hill country of Ephraim. This was in the middle of Israel, and people would travel to her to have their disputes settled. She was fiery and wise. One book I read suggested that she was able to see the breath of God in each person and the truth in their hearts. When the people cried out for deliverance, Deborah sent for Barak, the son of Abinoam, another interesting name. Barak means lightning. So the woman of fire sends for lightning to go into battle. She tells Barak, the Lord, the God of Israel commands you, go. Take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera with his chariots and troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Remember that at this time, Israel was sort of a confederation of different tribes, descended from Jacob and Joseph's sons. Naphtali and Zebulun were the tribes closest to Canaan, so it makes sense that Barak would gather his army from there. And Barak was likely already some sort of military leader, respected and able to gather that many fighting men. Deborah tells him to gather the men and go to Mount Tabor, a mountain with a view over the plains, a mountain near the Kishon River, which sometimes wasn't much more than a stream, but during the spring and during rainstorms could be a raging river. It's a strategic location. Note that God gives very specific 
detailed instructions to Barak. And Barak replies, if you go with me, I'll go. If you don't go with me, I won't go. It's an interesting response. He's being asked to do something incredibly risky. Sisera has a big army and sophisticated weapons. And it's hard to know if he responds this way because he trusts Deborah and wants her by his side, or because he doesn't trust her or God and is thinking, if I go down, I am taking you with me. One commentary suggested that Barak wanted Deborah to go with him because he saw her as being like the Ark of the Covenant, the embodiment of God's presence with the people, and wanted her to go as a sign of God's presence going with him into battle. That explanation touched me deeply especially in light of the gift of the Holy Spirit to all believers. We're all, like Deborah, in some sense, the embodiment of God's presence. What would it be like if we treated each other that way, as sacred and holy and full of the presence of God? And what if we especially treated women that way, as the embodiment of God's presence? Women who have somehow often been treated as less the image of God than men, whose bodies have been treated with suspicion and as objects to be used and abused. Deborah answers Barak, certainly, I will go with you. And she also warns him, the glory in the battle will not be yours. The Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. It's hard to know if this is a rebuke to Barak or simply Deborah telling him more about what's going to happen. Barak goes to summon the men and Deborah goes with him. And then the story is interrupted by this bit about Heber, whose name means ally. Heber is a descendant of Moses' brother-in-law. Another Exodus connection is not an Israelite and is camped in a place where they can see Barak and Deborah gathering the army. Heber tells Sisera, that Barak is on Mount Tabor, and Sisera and his army and those 900 chariots fitted with iron come to the river. And there's something that seems mythic about the battle, like that final battle at the Black Gate in the Lord of the Rings movies, that sense of a smaller force against a bigger, mightier foe. Deborah gives the command and Barak goes down to meet Sisera and his army and defeats them. The narrator makes clear that the Lord has gone before Barak and that the Lord routed the army. In the song that follows in Judges 5, there's language describing God coming as a storm against Sisera. Another play on Barak's name, Lightning. With his army defeated, Sisera runs away on foot. And he flees to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber. And the narrator tells us that there was an alliance between Jabin, the king of Canaan, and the family of Heber, the ally. So a non-Israelite family allied with Israel's oppressors. And yet already there's a clue that something is wrong here. Because alliance or not, Sisera has no business going to the tent of Heber's wife. 
According to the customs of hospitality, a man would never go to the tent of another man's wife. It insults Heber and dishonors Jael, his wife. No wonder she met him outside the tent. He was a threat. This is a military commander with a reputation for raping and killing those he conquered. And she is so brave. She invites him in despite the danger. He asks for a drink and she gives him not the cold water he asks for, but soothing milk. And then he tells her to stand in the doorway and lie if anyone is looking for him. He places her at risk for harboring a soldier for having a man other than her husband in her tent. So when he falls asleep, exhausted, she defends herself and her family with the tools she has on hand. Putting up and taking down tents was women's work. So she took a tent peg and a hammer and used them to kill Sisera. When Barak comes by, Jael goes out to meet him and invites him to see the man he's looking for and shows him Sisera on the ground with the tent peg through his head, dead. And then the narrator announces, on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites. The next chapter of Judges is probably the oldest, a song praising Deborah as a mother in Israel and Jael as most blessed of women. So what do we take with us this morning from this story of women heroes and from this story of battle and violence? especially in light of Jesus' commands to love our enemies and in light of Jesus' suffering and death. How do we fan the flames of these women within each of us to fight for justice, to protect the vulnerable, and follow Jesus' example of self-offering, non-violent love? I don't know. But I do know that the God revealed in this story and in the rest of scripture is a God who stands firmly against oppression. And I know that the God revealed in this story and in the rest of scripture cares about women and about what happens to women and their bodies. And I know that each and every one of us is created in the image of God, holy and sacred. And the Holy Spirit, God's presence, dwells in each of us. I was reminded as I worked with this passage of a line from Our World Belongs to God, a contemporary testimony. It's a statement of faith used sometimes in my home church, Boston Square CRC. The line is this, God holds this world in fierce love. God holds this world in fierce love. And that fierce love is revealed in Deborah, listening to God, and leading Israel in battle. And that fierce love is revealed in jail, the foreigner, defending herself and her family by killing Sisera. And that fierce love is also revealed in Jesus Christ, who died in our place and loves us with a love that will not let us go. Thanks be to God. 
Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we need you. We pray for our sisters and brothers around the world living in the midst of violence and oppression. We pray for deliverance and that you would give them great wisdom and great love. Guide us and use us and change us to bring about your shalom. We thank you for the witness of scripture that you hold this world and each one of us in fierce love. And we pray that you would fan the flames within each of us to act for justice, to protect the vulnerable, and most importantly, to willingly follow you wherever you lead us. In your name, amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We praise you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel and we give you thanks for all our ancestors in faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere and that you remain faithful to your covenant even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and victory. We come in remembrance and celebration for the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and die on the cross for us, to be raised from death on the third day, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church you have gathered with your children of faith in all places and times, we praise you with joy. Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion and on the eve of death, Jesus gathered the disciples for the feast of the Passover. Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, 
we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ's death, God, we proclaim. Christ's resurrection, we declare. Christ's coming, we await. Glory be to you, O God. Eternal God, we unite in this covenant of faith, recalling Christ's suffering and death, rejoicing in Christ's resurrection, and awaiting Christ's return in victory. We spread your table with these gifts of the earth and our labor. We present to you our very lives, committed to your service on behalf of all people. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit on this bread and juice and on our gifts and on us. Strengthen your universal church that it may be the champion of peace and justice in all the world. Restore the earth with your grace that is able to make all things new. Be present with us as we share this meal and throughout our lives, that we may know you as the Holy One, who with Christ and the Holy Spirit lives forever. Amen. Christ has prepared this table for all who are drawn to it. There are no rules in this church regarding membership or baptism in order to partake. When we say all are welcome here, we mean it. Come with your doubts and hopes to receive the grace of a God who places no barriers before you. In gathering around this table, may you find peace and hope in the love of God that we have in Jesus Christ. Friends, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God.
Let's pray together. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite with us all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, amen. Will you please rise to say together the affirmation of your mission statement? Responding to the living God with a progressive voice and working hands, we are called to feed Christ's community in mind, body, and spirit. As we go out from here, 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face smile upon you. May the Lord shine upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.